What's the word, everybody? Every single day on Instagram, email, Facebook, on the School of Drifts Instagram, their email, when I'm at the grocery store, when I'm at Home Depot, when I'm at anywhere, I get asked, what spring rate should I run? More than, are you okay, bro? Or, damn, I have a question for you. None. No one has any questions. Everything is always, what spring rate should I run? And I, for a while, I used to just be like, man, like, dude, like, it's not like a quick solution, you know? But like, like, I want to help people, right? But like, I also can't devote like 20 or 30 minutes to each person to like ask them 20 questions to figure out what spring rate they should get. So I started offering a service where people could buy coilovers that I custom built. There's a small upcharge, but then you get all of it custom, spring rate, shock stroke, um, bump stops changed, the uh, actual lengths of the springs, the mono ball top hat type deals, some other modifications with the valving, and the list goes on and on. But I gave that to people, so that way, like for a couple hundred bucks additional, like I could basically do a service for them, inspect them out a set of shocks that they know they would get, right? But every day, at least 10 times, what spring rates do I run, bro? I have an E46, I drift, what spring rates? And you're like, I can't tell you that. You haven't given me any information. So I'm gonna do a quick and dirty description and educational video on uh, spring rates and why you can't just run what your friend runs or why you can't just ask someone, what spring rates do I run? Um, because it's a big like mathematical equation. Um, First off, spring rate. The spring rate itself is how much force it takes to move it. So let's use 10 kilograms per millimeter or 10K as most people call it. That's like a 560 pound spring and that's per inch. So it takes 560 pounds of force to move the spring one inch. So if you have 10K springs on the front of your car and you have your motor, all that stuff's up front. Every inch that your car settles, it takes 1,120 pounds to do that because you got to compress both springs. So that gives you a quick example of like what the spring rate actually means. Um, and the conversion is 56 times uh, whatever K rating is to get to inch pounds, which is a little bit easier mathematically to figure out than kilograms of force per millimeter, which is what K means. Um, so, uh, how it works is obviously the more weight you put down on the spring, the more force you put on it, the more it compresses. So if you have a 50 K spring on your car or something and you're like, Oh, my car doesn't even move. It's so stiff because I'm super stancy boy. And I don't want my wheel to hit my fender. Like that's one way to do it. Just put a spring so stiff that it takes, you know, 5,000 pounds of force to move it an inch, um, which you'll never really get unless you jump your car or do something crazy. So things that change the spring rate and things you need to be paying attention to when you select a spring rate, the weight of your car. Obviously we just talked about how much weight it takes to push the spring down. Um, if you have a full weight car that's 4,000 pounds um, and you take all the weight out of it, you don't need as much spring rate as someone who hasn't taken all the weight out of it. So a simple fact of like, oh, I run an eight six on my car and you're like, okay, what does that mean? Like you could be driving a 2,200 pound S13, or you could be driving a 3,400 pound V8 S14. Like those two would not have any of the same spring rates in my opinion. Everybody mostly does the same spring rates, but it's definitely not the same spring rate because the effective weight and how it works. Um, so the other equation is what motor do you have in your car? So I have a, a Mustang with an EcoBoost motor the motor and trans in that car weigh like 370 pounds all in versus like maybe my friend has one with a coyote motor in it with the, the, the T56. That's like 600 pounds. Effectively, the spring rates for our cars are not going to be the same. Um, and you kind of see where I'm getting. Like when someone's like, what spring rates do I run? It's like very big mathematical equation. So like if you have a 240 with a 1J versus a 240 with a aluminum LS that's NA, that's like built for lightweight, the two front spring rates will not be the same. Um, then on top of that, there's motion ratio, which to be short is basically the ratio of where the shock sits and how much leverage it has on the actual wheel. Um, 
So if I have like a little drawing I can do, if it's like, this is super, super crude. Let's just say this is your car, right? And then let's say this is the, the top hat area. So if you have a shock that goes right here, this will be like 100%. So your 10K is a 10K spring. Now some cars, SC300, um, uh, RX7s, um, a bunch of cars that aren't strut design might have a shock that goes right here, which is like 60% of that. So that would be a 6K. Why is that? Because there's this much leverage on the actual spring. Ooh, got myself. So, oh, my homeboy with an SC300 runs 40K front springs. Well, no, he doesn't. It's like 22, which is still really high, obviously, but it's way different than if you have like an S13 or an E36 or a Mustang where it's like 90 something percent of this number. So just because you're like, my friend has this, doesn't mean, because it's a different car. Like the ratio of that, this is front and rear, you know, depending on where the shock is and the spring is and all that. Like an E36 is 58%, 59%. So a 10K spring with 560 in the bucket versus a true coilover, it's like more than 40% less spring rate. So you can't like go by that. Um, so, the other thing is like, oh, I'll do this too. The other thing is like, oh, this is my car. Like, I have the 10K, right? I'm super dope, stancy bro. Like center of my wheel is here. I put 50 mil over fenders on my car. Now I move my wheel out two inches. You've now moved this point, the tire two, two inches out, or uh, yeah, two inches out from this point. You've lowered your spring rate. So your homeboy that goes and drives around and drifts with like negative 20 offset wheels, goes to the track and puts, puts plus 40 on, he literally raised his spring rate like over a kilogram per millimeter. So like literally 50 or 60 pounds different just off wheel spacers. So like, again, with the spring rate question, like, bro, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what spring rates you can run. I can, if I tell you spring rates, it's just some generic bullshit, you know? Um, then on top of that, wheel spacers, motion ratio, all that, there's the geometry aspect of it. If you have a car like an S13 and you haven't changed any of the rear geometry and you put a super soft spring on it, the car gains and loses toe, it gains and loses camber throughout its sweep. So if you have a spring that's so soft because you're trying to make grip because the spring is soft or whatever your uh, equation is, you might actually be making less because as the car squats, you're losing a ton of contact patch on the tire or you're losing a bunch of weight transfer you know, so it's not just about like, oh, I'll put the softest springs ever in the back and it'll be as fast as possible. It doesn't always work that way. Like, for example, uh, an E36 or a Mustang or a solid axle Mustang, you can run a pretty soft spring rate in those because uh, they're, they don't really tow a lot and they don't really add a lot of camber. It's pretty straight up. You know, obviously there's some solid axle has none, right? So the tire contact patch becomes really, really good all the time. Whereas like my TI has a bunch of toe and a bunch of camber and it's awful. So like on the same, which is a very similar car on an E36, you might run a 10K rear spring in the back, which is like a six because of the motion ratio of 5.8, 5.9, um, depending on obviously your wheel spacers and what we just talked about. Um, the TI, I run an 18K rear spring in it, like almost twice the spring because the rear suspension is so awful that it's actually easier and faster to drive by just putting a bigger tire on it and stiffening the rear suspension up so that it doesn't do as much. Like you still want it to move, still want it to do things. 18K might sound ridiculous, but it's really only a 10, like because of the motion ratio, which is still ridiculous. Um, but it's just because the rear suspension is so bad that I want to limit that to make the car better to drive, right? Again, the equation is crazy. Like what tires do you run? You know, what what, are you running like an all-season tire? Okay, well, we can't run, you know, a stiffer spring in the front with an all-season tire because the tire will have less grip and availability than the suspension. It'd be too stiff, right? Um, same thing with the rear. Uh, super, super sticky rear tire. Um, then you want a stiffer rear spring because you don't need to have the suspension have so much movement and so much slop when the tire creates the grip that you need anyway. So it's 
quite complicated. Then on top of that comes the equation of the ride height. If you wanna be, the lower you wanna be, the higher your spring rate has to be because you have to be able to control that shock stroke. You know, like, so if you have a car that has six inches of available shock stroke, right? But your car is three inches off the ground, that means you have to set your springs and your rate up so that it will not make the car smash and bottom out, but at the same time, it'll hold it up and make the ride height that you want. Six inches of stroke sitting at three inches till it hits the floor, bottoms out, that means you can only have three inches of upward travel before you lose all your grip and you're smashing the car on the ground. So the spring rate affects that as well. As you go lower, essentially, you kind of have to come up in spring rate um, to be able to limit that. Um, then there's the sway bars. You know, like I run really big sway bars on my car. I also run really high spring rates in the front um, and pretty, pretty fa fa fairly soft in the rear. Um, <clears throat> but if you don't run sway bars and like, you have to make up with it somehow. So you gotta run some more spring and, and, and whatnot. And then in the rear, if you wanna run the big sway bar in the back, you can run a softer spring because you're kind of separating, separating the two. Um, sway bars mainly do side roll and, and the springs themselves do forward roll. So squatting and, and compressing under braking and all that is spring. And then body roll itself is sway bar. So. A lot of people are like, oh, I gotta stiffen my spring rates because I have so much body roll. Just put bigger sway bars on it if you're worried about body roll. That's what controls it. It's called an anti-roll bar for a reason. Um, so anyways, full circle. If you ask me what your spring rates are and I don't answer, it's probably because it takes me 30 to 45 minutes on a car that I know um, to get the equation for you and help you with that. I don't have time to do that for everyone. I do offer a service of building shocks and all that. So if you're interested in that, shoot me an email, orderdriftparts at gmail.com. I don't really care if you buy them from me or not. I'm just trying to help to be able to give back and at some point copy all of the, or uh, cover all of the time and effort I put into each of them and the technical support that's part of that. Um, but yeah, spring rates. Please stop asking me what spring rates to run. I feel awful saying that because I always try to answer as many questions as I can and go through and do all that. Obviously, it doesn't always happen, um, but it's very, very complex when it comes down to it. And it's a lot of like things I've learned and trial and error and understanding the dynamics of how all of these different drifting chassis or road race chassis and all that stuff work. Like I have a book of like just notes on what ratios people or cars have, the weights of engines, you know, driving styles and all that. So this doesn't really help you pick out your spring rate per se, but hopefully it'll help you understand what the spring rate is and uh, make some educated decisions based upon that. Let me know if you have any questions. I know that my entire feed of questions is gonna be what spring rate to run now because you guys are a bunch of ding-dongs. <laughs> but shoot, hit them up and uh, I'll try to answer them the best I can.